And you are watching PBS Books. Hi, I'm Fred Nahat. Nice to have you along with us for the latest in our series of conversations with trailblazing American women writers and featured uh, on this uh, stream today is the American poet, Marilyn Chin, whose career as a writer, a feminist, uh, an activist, a humorist, uh, and a provocateur has gained her a following all over the world. Looking forward to talking to Marilyn Chin coming up. We will also be joined by our friend, Alyssa New, founder and host of the PBS series, Poetry in America. All of this coming up at first, uh, let us welcome in our PBS Books Library Bureau Chief, Heather Montilla, uh, with a word on today's event. Heather, good to see you. Well, Fred, it is so great to be here as always. And we're so very thrilled um, to be able to continue our celebration of the 19th Amendment, trailblazing women, women breaking through barriers. Um, and, and for us, um, as we think about libraries across the country, being able to you know, 1800 libraries, our library partners across the country being able to participate and join in on learning more about Marilyn Shin. If, if they already know her, hearing from her, if they don't know her, getting to know her, and Lisa New, who is just a trailblazer herself in, in the work she's done to put together um, and, and highlight tremendous poets across, uh, across our nation. So this is really a wonderful moment and I'm glad to be part of it. So thanks, Fred. Well, and also in the mix uh, in this moment are our viewers. So if uh, if you're watching, you have a question for Elisa or for uh, Marilyn Chin coming up, simply type it into the Facebook Live comment box and we will ask it during uh, the conclusion uh, of this program. So all of that is uh, coming up. Uh, but first, we have a clip from the aforementioned Poetry in America series where we will introduce uh, Marilyn Chin and meet her on the other side. Let's watch. I'm trying to mix east and west. And high and low. High and low street and, and sublime, real and surreal. Hong Kong, San Francisco, San Jose. The path through the Golden Mountains is a three-tiered freeway. Look up, it suspends where no prophet can touch. My great-grandmother, when she came over in 1906, she was under the impression that all the streets in San Francisco were paved in gold. From the beginning, everybody has always said they've referred to San Francisco specifically as the gold mountain, the gum San. In all human imagination, there are the seven cities of gold, and there's the gold mountain, and this is what Columbus was looking for. And then 1849 came and there was they actually found gold here. The Chinese prospectors, 20,000 of them, came to San Francisco to work in the gold mines, and they called Gaogamsan the Golden Mountains. These are my people, the Cantonese, the Toisanese that came uh, from the southern provinces. They were the peasants. So they were coming with a gold rush, and then the next rush would be the building of the railroads. The path through the gold mountains was the tunneling through the Sierras for the railroad. Right after railroads were built, and we didn't need those men anymore, there were pogroms and burnings of Chinatowns and lynchings. We've been here for generations, and we kind of got exploited and exported out of China, uh, you know, with this promise of gold mountains. From season two of the PBS series, Poetry in America, Urban Love Poem from Marilyn Chin. Uh, time now to welcome in our guests, including Marilyn Chin, the award-winning poet and writer, uh, and of course, our friend, Alyssa New, founder, uh, and host of the Poetry in America series on PBS. Welcome to you both. Great to have you here on PBS Books. Thank you so much, Fred. That's wonderful. Uh, Marilyn, let me start with you. Um, and let me start by asking you about your personal history. Uh, the number one female offshoot of an immigrant family, the way I read it, uh, who since your arrival in this country, I guess you almost immediately went about the business uh, of, of being creative and writing and reconciling these experiences um, 
from Hong Kong and into America that almost seems uh, essential to you as a creative person? Yes, indeed. I I was born in the in you know in the late fifties in in a cold water flat in Hong Kong, and there were and it was a very interesting time and um, there there were you know migrants all the street. Um, it was, um, it was, you know, uh, we had, we, we ha had suffered a terrible um, war, you know, uh, in, in China. And um, um, it was, it was a terrible harrowing time. And I, um, and, but my grandmother carried me on her, on her back. And she, you know, I remember at, you know, at two years old, she carried me on her back. I was colicky. She carried me on her back and walked around the streets and and chanted Chinese poetry. And she was illiterate, but she had memorized, um, ch you know, hundreds of poems from the Tang Dynasty and Confucian sayings and so forth. She was amazing, and I never forgot those sounds. Although, although I didn't know what what the words meant but um but i grew up in portland oregon and i was and you know and i went to um and i studied classical chinese poetry as an undergraduate and i sat in these you know uh, in these libraries <laughs> dissecting ancient poems with strange illusions while my friends were out drinking you know, my type, I don't know what they're, but, but I was obsessed with poetry. I love poetry. And and meanwhile, I was reading at all the greats, the, you know, the I, um, Dickinson, Whitman, everybody. Yeah, even, yeah, Shakespeare. I was, you know, I was obsessed with poetry. So I, I really feel that I had a very good upbringing and that I, I uh, I pre I I was I learned both sides of my my literary heritage and and so that gave me gave me a strong foundation in poetry and and I feel very blessed you know that I I could have a a life in poetry it's just so ridiculous yeah it's just ridiculous it's a the ridiculous American dream oh it's <laughs> <laughs> Well, you could be a poet. <laughs> well, I, I have to. I have to ask you. We we going back and reading Urban Love Poem, and, and of course, it, it being showcased on Poetry in America, which is a terrific show. You have to check it out on PBS if you haven't watched it, uh, or on uh, on Passport. Talk to Elisa New about that um, uh, coming up, and I'll bring Elisa into this conversation uh, as well. It's almost an interpretive dance of the foreign and the familiar, the past and the present there in San Francisco. And it seems sort of stark and grim. And the irony of uh, the titling uh, jumps out. Uh, but then one looks deeper, uh, listens more uh, closely. Uh, uh, Alyssa New, where is the love in urban love poem? Find oh, really is. <laughs> you go ahead, Marilyn. There's so much love. Mm -hmm. You start and I'll pick it's up. It's really about a failed relationship. Actually, I don't remember the, the dude now, but I remember <laughs> the persimmon. You know, I mean, this, I remember the, the taste of persimmon and that condominium, that I, that dingy condominium where I, I lived in this tiny condominium. Um, yeah, and, and, I, yeah, and and strolling through the tenderloin, I remember going to strolling through the tenderloin, and and finding this X-rated bookstore, <laughs> and I buy and I buy a bunch of X-rated books, and I was, you know, there's just the um, yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. Yes, it is a love poem to the city, and and the, to to the golden mountains, to that mm -hmm. past that of my twenties, I cannot go back there, unfortunately. Um, it's uh, Lisa, let me pull you in on this because uh, we, we all love the show uh, so much and you, it is your, I guess, privilege to be able to sit down and extract these words, the, the meaning from the, uh, these works. How does Urban Love Poem uh, hit you? We saw you in the show, but give us a little bit more of your feeling on that. Well, 
I picked Urban Love Poem as the poem that would lead off the second season of the, of the series. And I picked it because it was a complex, textured love poem to a city that, that I thought would surprise readers, I, I'm sorry, surprise readers and, of the poem and viewers who might think that poetry is just soft and <laughs> sentimental. And what I love about this love poem to a city is that it's the poem we all would write to the city in which we found ourselves as free people free reckless people in our youth. I mean, Marilyn writes a poem about San Francisco that's about that moment when you are having a relationship with someone you will forget <laughs> uh, that's sweet nevertheless for the, the pleasure of the moment that um, you enjoy with that person. And she gives us a city as it imprints itself on our minds, good, bad, and ugly. One of my favorite things about this poem of, of um, Marilyn's is that, and that I chose to begin a television season with, is that the first word of her poem is condominium, <laughs> which is so unpoetic, <laughs> but so, real and true and contemporary poetry must have condominiums in it. <laughs> and, you know, a modern contemporary American poetry must have that. Condominiums and persimmons. <laughs> it, and, and Maryland's, it must have the complete infeasibility of San Francisco, this ridiculous city that's sinking into the earth awkwardly like a thin-hipped dowager, as Marilyn says, and it must have the hippie history of San Francisco, and it must have the distinguished history of Chinese immigration, the distinguished and neglected history of Chinese immigration to San Francisco that Marilyn builds into her poem. And so I, I love Marilyn's work, and I love this poem so much because it said, if you think you know what poetry is, you are wrong. <laughs> and this is what poetry can be and can do. And in that way, creating, uh, and I guess w one of the wonderful things about uh, Marilyn's work is creating uh, poetry from the uh, prosaic. Is, is it yours, Marilyn, to create, um, as a poet, some, some discomfort? To not only put it upon us to figure out your thoughts, but also maybe examine our own and what our perceptions may be uh, of a similar uh, experience. Yeah, it's what's interesting is I just came out with my selected poems and I did some readings around the, the nation mm -hmm. and and students have their favorites. They're just not, you know, it and um, and it's really interesting that Elisa uh, found this poem because it is such a personal poem I, about San Francisco and um, and, and, you know, and I had forgotten about it because I didn't like the dude. I forgot about the dude. <laughs> <laughs> but, but when Elisa found it and I realized, oh my gosh, it is a poem about San Francisco. And then I, I, uh, I, you know, uh, Hong Kong, the Hong Kong Lit Fest, um, showed this, uh, Elisa's great film, this great film. And, and then they had they conducted a a a a, a citywide contest on you know on the on urban love poem to you know and the students all participated and and hundreds of poems came in for and they wrote about their love for Hong Kong during this this difficult time yeah and so it the poem moved a lot of people and. And, you know, I don't know about, you know, poems, some poems are like little pretty jewels, you know, mm -hmm. like that you put in a, around a necklace. Some poems are like manifestos and some poems are like, I don't know, dreams. And, 
And but the thing is, is for me, the self represents something larger than the self. So I I begin with it with the condominium, but it opens up to larger issues. Issues about the self at 20 and issues about history and immigration history, uh, the history of, of America that is not that is not being told. And and also the heartache. I mean, the American dream, the dream of Golden Mountain, can we still achieve it? I mean, this year is so messed up. Yeah. I mean, what everything is in shambles. And and so so yeah, yeah, I feel very nostalgic now after you know, uh, when I reread that poem, I just feel uh, nostalgic for this this beautiful time in our youth, yeah. Yeah, Elisa, as you sit down, what you've created, and I can't talk, uh, say enough good things about Poetry in America, uh, not only you've created nearly the perfect show, I mean, it is a half an hour well worth uh, watching to get into, I don't, it seems, uh, Elisa, extemporaneous, the conversations, they're so free-flowing, uh, and uh, but at once also uh, deep uh, and informative. These uh, word impressionists, you know, in novels like The Landscape Painter, you know what it is. It sort of takes you there. But something about poets that demand that we decode them, and that is what you're able to do on, on the show. I know you have some favorites, uh, favorite works uh, from Marilyn, uh, Elisa. Talk a little bit about more uh, about sitting down with her, but also uh, your knowledge of the body of her work, uh, which is extraordinary. Well, Thank you, Fred, for your kind words about the show, which I do love. I love making uh, because I love um, helping. <laughs> I feel in some ways it's a kind of social work. Uh, we have an entire nation that's traumatized because they don't understand poetry and they think they should. And poetry is um, such an extraordinary art form that I love thinking about what is the story this particular poet is telling us that we need to hear and what is the mode of storytelling, the mode of linguistic literary storytelling that this poet has discovered, a new mode of storytelling. And how can I gather a set of interpreters who will, even though many of them don't even read poetry, they're kind of attuned to that kind of storytelling. And Marilyn's kind of storytelling is the storytelling of someone who draws um, on multiple cultures, um, the culture of, of China, the culture of her elders, of everybody's elders, everybody's scolding elders, the culture of contemporary America, the culture of 70s feminism that meets, yeah, the 70s feminism that's actually in a sort of frictive relationship right now with the feminism of today, the culture of protest that was engendered. And, and of course, also to go back to Marilyn's deep, deep knowledge, the many cultures of Chinese poetry over the ages and of American poetry. And her, her work um, delights me and instructs me both. And I don't know which is more important. The instruction because her poems have such, I sometimes say crunch. <laughs> There's so much to learn from them and and just experience in them. They're not just emotional. There's there's so much content. They're like so encyclopedic. Wow, I'll learn about this and I'll learn about that and I'll learn about the other if I if I want. And they're also so audacious. Yeah, they're tonally um, so out there, and they allow us to think. What do we gain by being out there? Right? What? And you know, is it that Chinese culture is out there in America, which part of Chinese culture is really out there and which part of American culture is really out there. And Marilyn is out there. 
<laughs> and sometimes her poems go in, but I think one of the really big questions, Marilyn, that your poetry asks is, you know, why just spit it out? <laughs> why just say what other people won't say? <laughs> Does that, and, and I, I don't mean that in any kind of cliche way, like you call yourself a turnip. <laughs> you write a poem where you call yourself a turn, you know, why be indelicate? Why be well, frank? Why offend people? Aren't I a, a nice Chinese girl? <laughs> exactly. Sweetest Chinese girl who sits in the back of the room, who gets perfect A's. Mm. I ain't a rich, you know, a crazy rich Asian. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm from the other side of the star fairy, as my friends would say, you know? I'm just, I, you know, um, and oh, for, for instance, lately I've been, because of the lockdown, I've been going to this duck pond, right? And I just, I, I think I'm gonna write a, a beautiful, you know, beautiful, serene uh, <laughs> landscape poem, but suddenly the muse, the bad girl muse slaps me and says, look, there's more to say. The world is burning up. You know, what are you gonna say about that? And, right. Yeah, so, so, so. What is the bad girl muse? What What is the role of the bad girl muse in our culture? Your poems are always asking that. It, 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 it kind of goes to process too, Marilyn, because we're so curious, people who want to uh, learn to write or get inspired by you, is the process with the muse um, more interpretive uh, or deliberative? Are you trying to get a thought across and then create a beautiful way to say it? Or are you looking for uh, beautiful intonation and hopefully the meaning comes through? Well, there, there are many ways to write a poem. If you look at my, you know, uh, at my 40 years of tinkering, there's mm -hmm. some poems that are like, as I say, little jewels. And there's some poems that, that are seven, seven or 10 pages long. It takes me seven years to write. I mean, the the 19th Amendment Ragtime Parade, which I will read later, took me seven months to write because it was commissioned by um, um, by by the New York Philharmonic and, and the Academy of American Poets. But it took me years to write it. I mean, not years, months to write. I, I did all this research. I spread everything on the floor, but it took me, but it just, it tortured me for seven months. And and sometimes a little a little haiku would torture me for months. I just, uh, it's hard to, it's, poetry is the quest for excellence. It's about, you know, it's about find the right vessel for your content, for your, and so, you know, I have a lot of content. I have a lot that I wanna say. Mm -hmm. And so it's really, uh, for me, it's it's you know it's really the whole the whole enchilada. I mean that right. you know finding the right imagery, the sonic, the the, the sounds and and juxtapositions. It's all this. It's very technical on on some level, but it's also very intuitive and and magical. So you ask the you know the goddess muse to hit you on the shoulder, but. Mm. Uh, but the same, you know, we're writing, you know, epiphanies, um, and and but simultaneously, you know, I I do a lot of research. I read poetry every day to to you know to to uh, get things ready to prepare for the muse to hit me. You know, but when, you know, if I if I could, you know, there's a you're so learned. And as Maxine Hong Kingston says in our in our film, nobody knows Chinese poetry like Marilyn. You study, you study, you're a good girl. <laughs> but what comes out of that good girl's mouth is very edgy. <laughs> and you know, I, you even you really, this is called trailblazing women. I mean, good. you often come out guns you know, verbal guns blazing. And it's pretty interesting the way you study so hard to come out with something that's so often so frontal. 
it's really, it's all basically about, according to uh, my therapist, it's about setting things right for my mother. I felt that my mother, um, my father uh, destroyed my mother. That is just, that's, um, that's where it all comes from. I mean, so, so my love of poetry, my rage, my, my, you know, need to make things right. I mean, um, huh. it comes from that deep love for my mother and my, and my deep love to make things right for her. The injustice, mm. really the deep injustice I feel, you know, daily. And I don't know, I just can't take that away from my soul, you know, so from my heart or from my, my mind. So, so really all, all the learnedness it's because I love poetry in mm -hmm. all forms. You know, the ancient- but You also must think it's a really potent instrument for- yes. for, um, for, for revenge. Injustice. I it's wrote- about revenge wrote, in my mother's trauma. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, that's, yeah. I, I, one hears that in your poetry. It's like, this is the last straw. I have had enough. And the voice of your poems is often the voice of I'm sorry, but it must be said. And yes. now, now you've told us it's your mother. <laughs> well, sorry. another question about uh, uh, about the process, about the work. Is it incumbent upon writers, uh, I guess writ large, uh, poets maybe specifically, to use contemporary imagery and some of the work as almost a calling card, some literary anthropology. So uh, for future readers, they kind of know this moment. Certainly we've, we've had a lot of moments uh, this year. Is there a way to speak uh, uh, to the future, plant something uh, for the future? Does that play into your writing, Marilyn? Wow, that's a very good question. You know, the, the, the thing is, um, People are rediscovering my poems, you know, 30 years later. And so there is something personal, because they're so personal and universal simultaneously and political, um, that that they sort of they survived the test of time. And I don't mm -hmm. I, I I don't know, maybe Elisa can talk about this, but but um I don't you know, um because my muse sort of lags behind the moment. So I write, I, I'm writing a poem about Trump. I, I've, I've written several, many poems about Trump and Obama. I've written poems, you know, occasion poems. Um, but I, but it's, it usually takes a year or so to, to, you know, to come to, fru for many of the poems to come to, to fruition, but, I am. Uh, it, it's hard to say because um, I, 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 the poems. Yeah, uh, 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 you know, uh, Elisa found found you know uh, um, um, urban love poem, but it's really I wrote it thirty years ago. You know, I, I wrote it, and it seems and it seems very contemporary. That that it still speaks about about many issues and so uh so that's that's the beauty of poetry because it you know it it just you know the best poems survive the test of time and mm -hmm. and you know um but i don't know if i could write for the future although i am writing a love poem to the wookie i don't know if that <laughs> <laughs> well. i don't know what but does that speak to the future? Well, you know, we 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 revel in uh, paradox. We keep even if it's not a complete poem, we keep small passages uh, that we we love and we memorize uh, and we quote uh, for a lifetime. Uh, Elisa, as a, a, a critic, a scholar, someone who studies not only the um, the works but also the people who create them. Is there some common uh, trait in the work or uh, in the author, some tendency uh, that suggests that this work will find permanence? What makes it last? Well, I'm not sure I, that's, a, that's a really big question. And I was 
um, preparing an answer to one uh -huh. I thought was uh, was we, was summoned by your last question, mm -hmm. and I think it might serve the purpose. And that is that I, I was thinking that Marilyn, as a poet who writes about immigrant experience, is a natural example of the immigrant poet as historian. Mm -hmm. um, immigrants are more conscious than other people of or or you know people who are sort of binational or cosmopolitan are more are sometimes more conscious of uh, than other people of change of historical change um because they've got parents who don't under, understand yeah yakking at them <laughs> and saying no no that's not the way the world is or that's that's uh, not the way it was there and they, it, it's, it's as though they internalize historical change um, in, in themselves. And so I, I think that um, one of the reasons I picked this old poem of, of Marilyn's when I knew I wanted to do a poem by Marilyn Shin, but I wanted one that would, for readers who might never read another one, because that's in some ways the standard of my show, I'm going to give you a poet, and if you never read another one, you're going to understand this poet, and you're going to understand something about America that you didn't understand before. What Marilyn gives us is a poem that is set in so many historical moments, in the 1850s, in the 1890s, in the Chinese, in the early 20th century of the Chinese Exclusion Act, in her own, you know, wild, uh, as we all had wild times in the 70s and her own wild 70s moments. And then, and I have to say, one of the things I really loved about Marilyn's poem is that it connects all of these to Silicon Valley. It connects, it's like, whoa, the Chinese Exclusion Act and Silicon Valley and, glo and contemporary globalization. And it tells that whole story um, and the story of the Western. I mean, it just tells so many, so so that the, the history that Marilyn as a poet is able to distill in, and the attitudes toward history and the conflict um, is what, um, is why I reached back 30 years um, for this poem of hers, reading, I mean, what I do as I think about, and often I, I'm, I discover the poets, the living poets whose poems I feature on, on the series Poetry in America are surprised at the ones I pick, usually not dismayed, or no one has told me they were dismayed, <laughs> but um, it's, and for Mar Marilyn is such a historical poet and such a learned poet and such a funny and contemporary poet that I wanted all of that. And, and of course, uh, history is something that is omnipresent uh, in poetry in America, such a great lilt to it as it connects and contextualizes the poet, the work, uh, uh, and from whence uh, it or they came. Uh, let's take another clip at poetry, another look at the clip of Poetry in America on PBS, uh, and we'll talk about it on the other side. Oh, the small delectables of day. Persimmons from Chinatown. A stroll through the tenderloin with the man I love. My darling, please don't be sad. I've parked my horse in this gray, gray sunrise to gather sweet crocuses and jonquils for you. This poem is called Urban Love Poem. What kind of love or loves are we talking about? I first thought that the love she was talking about was a romantic love. And the more I read the poem, the more I felt like that romantic love was a romantic love for the city. She doesn't much talk about her lover. It just seems like she's strolling through San Francisco and thinking about how it is a romantic place. There was a poetry reading in every corner. There were bookstores. There was a way to be a bohemian poet. They had a reputation of being a place where you get to experiment a little bit. Is this a poem 
to the city? Is this a poem about urban lovers? It's all the above. It's about the self representing something larger. The love that stands out for me in this poem is the kind of love that might have happened in the Tenderloin in San Francisco at a certain time. Giddy, a little bit dangerous, maybe young. <laughs> yeah, young in that maybe it's not going to last forever. What does she call it? She calls it uh, the small delectables. We're just going to... This isn't... We're not going to have a long-term marriage here. <laughs> We're going to have a small delectable. Uh, it is so, so, one of the things that makes it so perfect, at least in this series, is every piece fits, including those guests. Uh, amongst the two of you, talk about uh, the guest lineup in this episode. Uh, they're amazing. So Marilyn, you and Max, you and Maxine know each other, and she told me lovely stories about the two of you. So why don't you start with that? Oh, I, I, she's she's just the goddess. I'm at least just the <laughs> goddess of you know a po <laughs> the goddess of mercy for poetry, right? Mm. <laughs> but Maxine Hong Kingston. I mean, I uh, the Woman Warrior was such an important book for me, and I and that book taught me how to be a Chinese American writer. It just gave me permission to go on. She's, and, and so I think I'm going to, um, you know, uh, 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 attribute my next book to her. Yeah, I think she's just, she is the mother of, of Chinese American literature. There's just, you know, she's, there's just no, no other. I mean, she's, she's, um, and, and and she's so generous. She is so generous. Um, and so I, I will tell a, sh a little story of when we were filming her in her exquisitely beautiful house, small, modest, good, gorgeous house in the Berkeley Hills, um, where she's so gracious. And I mean, it was just such a delight to be there. And she's so unselfconscious that there we are, we've got three cameras and lights and we're miked every which way. And Maxine is just chatting away about you. And suddenly in the middle of the shot, she just stands up and walks into the kitchen, <laughs> and, you know, to get a drink of water. We're like, uh, hello, Maxine. And she had just sort of in a very beautiful way, um, forgotten and in just as beautiful a way as she was preparing to um, film with me, she took your poem to her book group and read it oh. with the group and then relays in the episode how everyone wept um, at the line where you say, please don't be sad. <laughs> um, and so she's a very, very lovely person. I'll say about um, some of the other guests in the show, Randy Commissar is a, a famous venture capitalist in Silicon Valley um, who knows Silicon Valley from the beginning and who's one of those hippie venture capitalists who came before the 80s, who came precisely at the time that Marilyn did and believing in in tech in that uh, whole earth catalog <laughs> kind of way. And he loved the poem so much. He actually, I had met him because uh, he studied, um, he, he, he studied Zen Buddhism and he and I had read haiku, haiku together. And then for this episode, as we do in Poetry in America, we like to gather a, a chorus, uh, an ensemble group of really knowledgeable people. And so we were able to gather two mural painters and a comed a kind of comic writer and an activist in San Francisco's Chinatown to offer their views. And they were a wonderful example for me of how anybody can read poetry. You just have to kind of park yourself next to the lines and, you know, you'll you'll get them. And yes, these were readers who had 
a specific body of knowledge about San Francisco and love the city already, but it, it really just, it spoke to them. Well, and don't let it be lost that uh, sort of the sensibility, the different facets of uh, Marilyn, as we talk about her, like she's not here, uh, to you, Elisa, you represented those in, in the lineup, just another great aspect uh, of the show, uh, uh, Poetry in America uh, on PBS. Okay, let's go, let's talk about, um, let's talk about the 19th uh, Amendment and get to this, uh, this poetry uh, reading because we are we are pledged to do that uh, in as much as um, uh, it tormented you for months and months and months. We always say the uh, from irritation comes inspiration. The, the the sand is the is the pearl and the oyster. Uh, so let us see the result of that, and then we'll talk about I guess the whole um, the whole facet of 1919, this hundredth year uh, anniversary coming up. Oh. Uh, but it is the 19th Amendment ragtime. Parade. Let's hear it. Uh, yeah, it's 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 kind of difficult to read, but I, I'll I'll do my best. We got all night. Nineteenth <laughs> Amendment Ragtime Parade. Birthday, birthday, hooray, hooray! The Nineteenth Amendment was ratified today. Drum rolls, piano rolls, trumpets bray. The 19th Amendment was ratified today. Left hand bounces, right hand strays. Maestro Joplin is leading the parade. Syncopated hash hashtags, polyrhythmic goose steps. Ladies march to Pennsylvania Avenue. Celebrate. Ooh, <laughs> Cater well. Praise women's suffrage is all the rage. Mothers, sisters, throw off your bustles, petal your pushers to the voting booth. Pram it, waltz it, studer baker, roaster it. Drive your horseless carriage into the fray. Prime your symbols, flute your skirts, one step, two step, kick. Ball change, quarter walk, tur turkey trot, grizzly bear waltz, Argentine tango, flirty and hot, mommies, grannies, young and old biddies, temperance ladies, sip bathtub gin, unmuzzle your girl dogs, Iowa your demahogs, battle axe, poly mask, gangster moms. Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Katie Statton, Lucy Burns, and Carrie Chapman Cat, Alice Paul, come one, come all, signed the declaration at Seneca Falls. Data face spinsters, war bond proof rocks. Lillian Gish, make a silent wish. <laughs> Have you seen Cakewalk? Wreck Mononoff, rap. Preternatural hair bobs, hamster wheels. Crescendos, diminuendos, manico, pianos, syncopation mad. Cut the rug with dad. Oompa, tuba, <laughs> majorette, girl power, baton over spam a lot. Tiny babies wearing onesies, raise your bottles, tater tots. <laughs> Accordion nannies, washbird symphonies, timpani glissado, the great war is over. Victory, freedom, justice, reason, Pikachu, sunflowers, pussy hats. Toss up your skull caps, wide brim feathers. Throw shade on the seraphim. Hide your cell phones. Raise your megaphones, speak truth to power, and vote, vote, vote. Warning. Nick wit legislators, gerrymandering fools, dim wit commissioners, judicial tools, toxic senators, unholy congressmen, halitosis ombudsmen, moral <laughs> tricks, doom path demagogues, racketeering mules, whack-a-mole sheriffs on the take, fornicator governators, rake hell collaborators, tweeter 
impersonators, racist prigs, postbellum agitators, hooligan aldermen, profiteering warmongers, reconstruction drags. Better run, rascals. Better pray. We'll vote you out on judgment day. <laughs> Better run, rascals. Better pray. We'll vote you out on election day. Yay, we did vote you out, didn't we? Not well, I'll tell you something. <laughs> The, the, and, and I'm reading along uh, as, as you recite it. Uh, the more it seems like 1919, the more it seems like uh, today and this week. And yeah. I, I guess that's the essence of it. Yeah. And but it has such crunch, right? Crunch. It's like, it's, you know, if you want to learn about Lillian Gish making a silent <laughs> Lillian Gish, the silent film star, it's just so full of little nuggets of of information. It's and wit. Mm, it's so brilliant. You, well, you can tell why I suffered writing this. It took me like seven months to. I mean, it's just with all the research and trying to combine. I mean, it's I'm using the Whit the Whitman job, really, mm. but I'm also using you know the couplet the 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 full rhymes and internal rhymes and we're just the juxtapositions and the and the last part the uh the warning part is actually a sonnet so i just so it's like because it nails the coffin shut you know <laughs> it, it, it how, but you know, it's, it's like virtuoso it reminds us poetry is a performance right right it's you're like bringing out, you're pulling out all the stops, you're doing the razzmatazz, you're dancing. And dancing. that's and what you're dancing do. And, and parading. There's a parade. Yeah. And it's, and I'm uh, channeling, you know, I'm also cha channeling uh, Scott Joplin and the, and the rag and ragtime music. Uh, 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 yeah, yeah then, nothing, uh, of Debussy uh, and Rachmaninoff. I, I'm curious, how do you struggle? Do you struggle by getting half of it and struggle to get the second half, or do you struggle to get the whole thing? Oh my gosh, it was like, <laughs> yeah, I I did a lot of research because you know, uh, uh, you know, about this hunt. It took them years to get this ratified. It was just. You know the history of it is is fascinating and and insufferable and and these ladies worked so hard. It was just and Susan B. Anthony, you know, she died before you know she didn't have a chance to see the ratification. She rode the train up to talk to, you know, to talk to my, uh, coal miners and they and and they spat on her. She was, I mean, these. I mean, it was the history it was rich, but these parades, I, they, they, you know, and that's why they're in couplets because mm -hmm. you can see the ladies marching in these couplets and, and yeah, and they they have their babies in tow and they're, they're like, like image jokes. They're jokes within the lines and, yeah. 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 It has a documentary. I mean, you, it really is. You are there, but you're in mm -hmm. so many different historical moments. And you make history so much fun. That is the thing I love about you, that you're you're telling American history and world history. And the um, it's it's fun. Yeah. I'm, hu I'm human history and, and um, struggle uh, and... Uh, let's 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 be honest. Uh, it, it was ratified, uh, but it, everything wasn't uh, perfect and still isn't. Uh, you know, I'm curious about when we talk to writers, uh, novelists, authors, uh, poets. We never want to ask them what their favorite work is because it's like children. They always give that standard answer. Yeah. But the one thing I'm curious about is what is what is your relationship with? I guess uh, Elisa and I know what our relationship is with your work. What is your relationship with the things that you create? Oh my gosh! I mean, it's like asking <laughs> ask me to to choose favorites amongst our children. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's like the, the cliche that that's that writers, you know, that poets say. But um, um, I don't know. It's I mean, th this poem tortured me for seven months. But after I, I 
I finished it. I was just really happy that mm-hmm. I was I, I was able to get together. And I said, "Oh my God, this is such you're a beautiful child." Yep. I, I just you know, <laughs> and it's worth it. And, and it was all worth it. And, and 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 it has history. And I also you know had a chance to 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 trash those lying, cheating <laughs> Republican you know co- you know corrupt. Congressman, you know, what I mean, I just it, it, it's it's um, there's joy in it, and then and there's but there's there's really it, it's really hard to write good poetry. I mean, mm. I I could some quatrains take you know would t- take me forever. I mean, my haiku, I wrote 25 haiku, but it took me like many years to finish them. I mean, it's it's not um, and so and so. Uh, so I, I, it's, it's one child at a time. So if I'm focused on, it's really about focus and it's bringing to bear all my learn, learningness, everything I learned from the past and calling these different muses. I knew this is a poem which is ecstatic. It's an ecstatic poem. So I had to mm-hmm. think about, I had to reread Whitman, you know, because, because Whitman, you know, his, his poem, his lyrics poem, is a you know it's an elegy, but but it's but the beats, the I mean, but it's so vivid and 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 you know and and forceful and it, and it's yeah you know, and I I think that um, that I you know uh, I, I was really proud of this poem that I could I could serve. Uh, the moment, this this historical moment, and also make it fun and be, you know, make make it viv- the word more vivid and um, and and you know that Rachmaninoff uh, really loved uh, ragtime. He really he oh. was influenced that you know those those stuffy uh, <laughs> composers really loved you know uh, Scott Joplin's work and were influenced uh, by it. So. So you know, it's um, so I have I have great fun doing the research and reading poetry and going back and reading Whitman to prep for this, uh, but also at, you know the Chinese couplet. As you can see, the couplets the Chinese are really into couplets. You go you go to China and they you know are, during Chinese New Year you see cu- couplets. They're you know you know <laughs> everywhere because they're. Uh, they're really part of the vernacular, part of the tradition, and and so I, you know, I melded the two, often me- melding two traditions together. But uh, but I also call call off my, you know, I call on Whitman, the ecstatic poet, to, you know, to propel me forward. And and also I was dancing. I was doing. You know, <laughs> the ladies are dancing, and I, I, I researched the dances, and I, you know, and I, I went to YouTube and I started dancing, and it's really a full body experience because I, I, you know, I, I'm the ladies are marching and dancing, and they're they're yelling at these, you know, and we're yelling at these, um, you know, these, uh, the these bad, you know, the these these complicit bad actors, you know, these. Uh, yeah. So, so, um, so that's a very different kind of poem from, mm-hmm. from let's say, from the urban love poem. It's, Everything in between, a full uh, bodied experience. Uh, looks like uh, the clock on the wall says they are uh, telling me it's it's time to go. But uh, at least to do oh. a final note from you. Um, I'm just so happy to be with Marilyn again, oh. and you, Fred, as well. Thank you. What joy. Um, oh, thank you. I mean, the, the, the time flew by. It flew by. It flew by. It was so much fun. I can not read the turn up. Marilyn and I will do more. Marilyn, please send me the 100, um, the Hong Kong kids poems. Okay. I want to see, yeah. see them and, uh, yeah, and showcase them somehow. Thank, thank you, you so you much. She Thank is Elisa Newman, who is the founder and host and moderator uh, and visionary of Poetry in America on your PBS station. Uh, and she is Marilyn Chin, award-winning, trailblazing American woman, writer, and poet. Great thanks to both of you for being with us on PBS Books. 
Thank you so Thank much, you, Fred. Fred. Thank you, Elisa. Bye, Marilyn. Bye to, bye to you both. Stay safe. Bye. Bye-bye.